particular interview that we're doing um, today, um, uh, because I know many of you in the martial arts space will know exactly who this gentleman is. Now, I want to go back um, a few uh, years ago. So uh, sometimes gets a bit of a bad press, good press as well. Um, but undoubtedly, and I have said this in my seminars that I teach, constantly say, you cannot deny this guy's uh, business acumen. You cannot deny what he has achieved and what he's done um, within the martial arts industry. The biggest, I think it's the largest martial arts franchise in the world. Um, done incredible things in martial arts business. And um, I've got to know him as well. And uh, over the years, slowly, slowly got to know who he is. And he's a, I, I, I absolutely think he's a, a top, top guy. Um, and actually a real giving person as well, okay? Got a heart of gold, and I really, really like him. I'd uh, like to re welcome to the podcast, Mr. Matt Fidesz. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, Gordon. I'll pay you later for that amazing intro. Thank <laughs> you very much. Very um, good. No, Matt, I'm an honest person. I wouldn't say what I didn't think, as you know. So, no, welcome. Well, it's good honor to be on. Thanks for having me on, sir. Uh, we we love uh, I, I, we've been trying to do this for a few years, but a few months, a fair few months. I mean, at the start of the pandemic, we were talking about getting like, getting you on doing the podcast and and sharing your message. But um, first of all, like Matt, it's great to have you with us, and um, you know, it's great to communicate with you and chat with you. And you've got a you've got a big heart, and I want to get that out to the martial arts world right now. You have a big heart. You're a nice guy. You're a good guy. Um, I spot people who are like when, when we first met straight away. I knew you were a decent guy, no matter what the tabloids or you know people say, etc. But I always go with what's in someone's heart, and you absolutely have got a big heart. And I know you've got you know we'll talk about your journey in uh, the arts and what you've done, etc. Because I think it'd be really powerful um, to share that today. So um, let's get let's get to it. So uh, Matt, um, first of all, it'd be really good for the listeners and you know whoever doesn't know you. Uh, great. Just explain who you are and what, what you've done, what you've got, etc., and uh, how long you've been in the martial arts industry. Sure. My name is Matt Fidesz. I've been in the martial arts industry. I've been training since I was five years old. Um, started off in a Taekwondo, WTF Taekwondo is my thing, my traditional side. I was, was very passionate about that, but at 41, the kick in has become a bit more difficult, Gordon. But uh, in my head, it's, I can still do it. Physically, it's not like you can see like it was eight, nine years ago. But mm. uh, yeah, I built up a martial arts business, started it when I was 17. I was one of one of three, the first people to bring, bring the concept from the United States of martial arts business to the UK. And what I mean by that is the first people to do what you call direct debits now. Back then, we they were called standing orders. We never had direct debits. That was a mind shift, shift everyone saying it can't be done. And no one in martial arts would do it where we did. We implemented some of the stuff from America. 70% of the stuff worked. Some of the stuff didn't work. And we adapted that and made some changes and learned how to make it work over the years. And it was myself, John Jepson, Kim Stones, and a guy called Lee Charles, who, who um, I have a lot of respect for, no matter what people say about him. Don't judge people till you meet them. He's another guy who's a heart of gold, wonderful man. 100%. Used to train with him, work out with him at his gym. I actually served protein drinks at his gym, Good. I don't know if you knew that for a while, I worked for him. When I was 14 years old, I believe, and and um, he was the guy who was like waving around, hey, Matt, you got to see what's going on in America, you know. I just He went out there and couldn't believe it. They got thousands of members. And back then, it's all about standards for us, you know, drilled in an in a Olympic style of Taekwondo. The thing about us all, especially with Lee, too, because he was like multi-champion at that point, like six times British champion. We didn't want to compromise our standards for money. And we just wanted to teach for a living. Lee had already work that out in some form and um yeah that was the whole thing but lee assured us all they're not compromising standards for money get, get yourself out there have a look what's going on and that's that's where it led i worked and working as a lifeguard for two pounds 75 an hour at the time uh did some personal training at lee's gym um with people at 16 years old um you know i, I my my didn't know what to do. I had no qualifications whatsoever ever than my black belt. I failed all my exams. I'm not I'm not proud of that, Gordon. I just wasn't very good at it. And I just felt why learn stuff at school. I just felt like it was a babysitting service. Why do maths when I got a calculator? You know, why learn how to have my handwriting perfectly 
when we got computers. It just didn't make sense to me. And I didn't, I enjoyed history and learning stuff like I've studied now, like nonfiction stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend my time reading a book or anything like that, a fictional book. Anything I watch on TV needs to be something I absorb. So to me, I just felt like school was a complete waste of time. Now, if you want to be in a skill, like be a doctor or a nurse or a dentist and stuff, of course, school is very important. But for me, I just wanted to be a martial artist. At 12 years old, I was in, the, in my maths class. I still remember it to this day. Back in my exercise book, I wrote down all the goals. I'd already studied goal setting by that point. And being around Lee and, and um, people training at a high level too, working for him in his gym, I could see he set goals at a young age and achieved them. He was already successful teaching martial arts and had his gym in Swindon. And um, that had a rub of effect on me too. When you're working out with, with, with someone like Lee Charles, and we, even if we're doing weight training together, he'd push me the extra limit, even though I was only like 15 years old. And, you know, he was never my instructor. I used to jump in some of his classes sometimes, but he was ICF Taekwondo, the other side of the, uh, of um, our art, basically. But I used to jump in some of his classes sometimes and uh, um, just kind of, I was in the right inner circle from an early age and that went on to greater inner circles, you know. They always say your net worth is your network and that, and that is pretty much, I think we used to be educated, me and Lee, is that you become the people you mix with in the books you read um right from a young age so yeah these americans that they were just impressed by this young kid 17 years old and this that i became very friendly with a guy called dave kova a lot of you know his household name in the martial arts uh, my instructor good very very close friend of mine and um he took me on his wing they so impressed with my ambition um that uh yeah i just made it work and i think even lee had his doubts because of my age and stuff, wherever I'll make it work. But when I started making the noise, uh, and then back then it was all about cracking the first one to crack the ten thousand pound a month mark, yeah. and that was the thing. Kim Stones was the first guy to do it. Master Stones from Doncaster, and we had a big celebration over that. Yeah. And then when he did it, John Jepson did it, then I did it, and um, I was the young kid, you know. And they were like, uh, "What the hell's going on?" When I was getting all the, these awards. Like, what's this kid doing? You know, I'm Frank Murphy and stuff. He, he's always spoken highly of what I do. And uh, yeah, and then from there, I went, went and built my own kind of martial arts empire, as, you, as it were, and franchised it out and uh, went international with it too. I then went into did the same thing with other subjects. So with, uh, uh, you know, different types of uh, sporting subjects, basically. Same business model, different subjects. We just adapt it, like to dance and so on. And it works beautifully as well. But obviously, martial arts is my passion and stuff. And so is weight training. Although I lost a, I've lost a lot of muscle in the lockdown, I have to admit. Every time I start getting into it, the gym, they shut the gyms on me. But uh, <laughs> I'll be back, as Arnold says. I'll be back. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that's my life in a nutshell. Thousand, I think we've got like 1,020 schools now. We've got 11 opening up in lockdown. One of my franchisees, but he's not letting it bother him. He's opened up 11 new locations in lockdown. And uh we're still going to keep growing. I'm still as passionate about it now as ever. We'll still train. I'll never be out of shape. That's just something about my my who I am, really. And, um, yeah, just working to the walls. I just love helping people, Gordon. You know, it's not about the money with me anymore. It's, I'll, be, I'll be lying to say it wasn't when I was in my early 20s, but now it's not. It's, it's about uh, I just love helping people become financially free. And I, and I get a thrill from that. Just like when you watch the kids and the adults get their black belt and you see the mum and dad crying it's no better feeling in the world. And um, with me, I just like helping people. And, and that's if I could just help someone today just to go on and be inspired and be successful in whatever they do, then uh, that'll make me happy. It's amazing, mate. It's really good. And you can feel the authenticity in what you're saying there. And I know on that journey, so you kind of brushed over it very, very quickly. But, you know, to achieve what you did, you're at 17 years of age. Yeah. Um, you opened your first martial arts school. Is that when you, was, when you were 17? Yeah. And, you know, talk mm. through the first sort of year of that. Like, what was your thing that you did at that? You know, when you first started, you were all out. Was it full-time part? What did you do for that first 12 months at 17 years of age? So we go to these seminars back then, and the Americans would fly in. Um, and my, my, your friends, like Lee and stuff, will tell you, and Kim Stones and stuff, John Jepson. By the time, by the time I drive from where the seminars were held, which is Swindon, to my home in North Devon, which is about two and a half hours, I would have everything implemented, ready to go. 
I was an action taker big time. You know, I just I just wanted to get on with it. I wanted to be ahead of Kim Stones, you know, I, uh, and stuff. And uh, me and him have running joke. He was actually on a, on a podcast yesterday with me with Rob Moore. I saw him making them comment. And he used to say to me, uh, you'll never catch me, man. You'll never catch me. I said, I will, Kim. <laughs> I'll teach you how to kick kick properly too. And he was like, world champion at that point. So uh, I was scared to death of him. So sometimes <laughs> he still had the business back then. He was huge. And uh, in the martial arts world. And But no, we, we had this banter upon us. And us four uh, really connected. Uh, another guy too called Ken Pankovic as well uh, to, to make this happen. But no, I just took massive action. I didn't doubt it. I didn't have anything else to do, Gord. I, I'd done, I'd always worked, worked at McDonald's. I'd done pizza hut delivering, all these jobs uh, that I was allowed to do at 16 to make money to be able to do this. It went against what my parents talk, told me. My mum was a lawyer. Um, she passed away sadly at 56 in 2012. That's when I really woke up and become a, um, you know, a bit more humble, I guess, and open to the martial arts world because i i stay closed in for a purpose to be controversial which we'll talk about later um and a lot of the negative stuff we we thrive on that i mean we we like the hate that's our free purposes but the um yeah it, it was just taking massive action 17 to presented issues with me because you try getting guys to work for you who are in their 30s for, for a 17 year old and then the legal issue too my first full-time center in Barstable was owned by an estate agent. But you imagine, I walk in there with, with a tracksuit on, and uh, I say to the guy, I want to look at rate, you know, using his building. And at the time, it was all offices, and I had to be all knocked down, the partitions, to make it into a dojo. And he stared at me and thought I was crazy. He said, how are you going to make any money? I cry. How the heck are you going to make any money out of it? And he said, you've got to knock down all my offices, and if it goes wrong, then I'm left with one big open room. But my mum was a conveyancing lawyer, and she convinced him Give my son a chance i think i think he could make it happen so he gave me six months rent free and i remember it so well back then because i just saved enough money working as a lifeguard at two pounds 75 an hour uh to, to be able to to get the paint done and stuff and myself and the girl, girlfriend at the time uh we, i remember the premises is very famous in north devon for the launch of uh, the mf brand it, we still got it to this day and it's right on the front of square and i remember on new year's eve and I was painting with her, and they were doing the celebrations with the fireworks at midnight. And I was questioning myself, I think, am I doing the right thing here? But then you are, you're doing, you're going against the grain, you're doing what others won't. And that was a big lesson. And and the story to the lease, too, is that I can't you can't sign a lease at 17 years old. You know, I'm not an adult officially, but my girlfriend was. So wrongly or rightly, I mean she's friends with me now. She goes to trains at one of my schools too. I um I we I asked her politely because she changed her name by depot to Fidesz. And she, she, signed, she she kind of signed the lease basically and uh off we went the, the landlord was happy six months rent free you know six months later i had 700 members i was doing uh really? 700 active members at one location where i was doing eighty thousand a month in income and that was a combination of billing and all the other income streams gradings and everything else a couple of grand a month overheads and yeah it was That's just like, i thought it was like uh at the time, I just thought it was luck, if I'm honest, because I didn't have anything to compare it to. And then I just, and uh, it was, I was teaching 20 hours a week of classes. I think the issue you ha I had then is that the mentality that you have to be a black belt to, to be able to teach. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I never had black belt students. Mm -hmm. And a mentality that it's got to be six, seven, eight, nine year journey too. Yeah. So I had to get my head around the concept, my, my mindset to get how can I produce instructors that aren't black belt? I don't get that. I've never. That's not how I've been brought up in the martial arts, or especially in WTF traditional Taekwondo. So my instructor disowned me. I mean, one of them did it, but one the, the, the one who was president of the organization just disowned me. And I think he disowned uh, Lee as well, actually, over what we were doing. It's funny because years later, they copied exactly what we were doing. Hey, like, yeah. Down to the whole thing, and then we launched it across their association. But that's another story. But no, I didn't know any different, and I had to make it work because I wanted to prove the bullies wrong at school. I wanted to prove my mum and dad wrong. You know, they didn't talk to me for a couple of years because they thought I was making waste of my life. They wanted me, me to be a vet. But I just loved kicking people in the head, Gord. Yeah. I, I tried Jiu-Jitsu at first. That was the first style I tried. And I couldn't handle I didn't like being thrown. I mean, I'm six foot four. It's just, it's just not my thing. Uh, break falls and stuff. But I got these long legs. And for some reason, I could already do the splits and stuff. And I just love kicking people in the head. You know, not not nasty. Just get a fill out of sparring yeah. and kicking people yeah. in the head. 
stuff and it, it was my thing with wtf just right on my street and uh yeah i had to learn to accept to bring in new ideas embrace it to what parents want not what i want what do the parents want they couldn't care less how many championships i'd won as a kid in wtf like one day they couldn't care less about my trophies mm. my, my awards how high i can kick whether i could do the splits on the chairs and that was one of my goals gordon i know it sounds ridiculous but <laughs> blood sport mate <laughs> i don't know what we did i mean lee charles was awesome at it actually and uh and yeah we just went as one of my goal sheets is getting to be able to do splits on the chairs being able to kick the ceiling at school all these nutty things i look back and think what were you thinking matt you know and it's funny you know, when you drive and i had this tremendous hate towards me at the beginning from the martial arts industry but and my local town couldn't really make out of me but when you're when you're like 20 years old and you're driving around with a perm long hair with your top off with baby Lil, in fantastic shape we all, we all worked hard well me charles the everyone we six packed up all the time perfection with 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 a uh, juro tan on fake tan, <laughs> yeah. and you're in this ferrari and you're hanging around with the most famous people in the world and you wonder why people hate you and can't relate to you, to you. well back then when you're a kid you just don't get it now when i look back i understand why people might have thought it was a little weird and strange why this kid popped into my town with thirty thousand people got best part of a thousand people training making a fortune everyone's talking about you making up all these stories they never even met me it was outrageous and uh got a, imagine seeing a ferrari in a little country town it's unheard of <laughs> you know the gossip was unreal people just when when the iphones came when cam the smartphones came out it became irritating everywhere i went they were they were taking pictures but yeah i i, I get it now but back then i didn't get it but you, i got taught very early on to embrace the uh the hate and the reason i I didn't go to martial arts events and stuff because I want I wanted to keep what I've been taught the mystery going the controversy yeah. and and a lot of the stuff that I do media wise I'm behind it you know I'm behind what I, I, it's a strategy in order to be have people interested in what you do you have to be an interesting person and people who watch this have always talked about me loved me or hate me they probably they've never met me I can assure you but when I go to an event you see what it's like i've been event with me all day long all they want to do is have a picture and an autograph and so on and uh i'm trying to be at a martial arts event to enjoy it which is becoming impossible for me and then i get told by organizers of the event you know the guys who hate you they've just been on that long queue mm -hmm. and I, well the first time i met you actually uh good was the first martial arts event i, I did it for bob sykes as a favor yeah. to Never. show up and I, and I showed up um and i wanted to go for, to my kids to have an experience to see other martial arts in action and for me too it's martial arts but it was impossible from the minute i turned up there i was literally mob silly and um yeah it, it was i loved it was good for me because in my head the keyboard warrior sir i was worried about which way it was going to go mm. but um yeah it, it was just the love i felt that day from all the martial arts i didn't get a chance to actually experience it i remember getting in the car and i said to my wife like flipping heck that was just exhausting there's the non-stop Mm. Can I have a picture? Can I have this? And, and then Bob said to me, I said, I told you, Matt, I told you, they're, they're not really haters. They just don't know you as a person, that you're a nice guy. You've created this image that they can't understand. And I told you, you need to get out there more and talk to these guys and show them what you're all about. And that day, they saw you're approachable. You're a nice guy. You did every, you shook every hand, took every picture, mm. you talked to everyone. And uh, and that's what it's all about. That's, that's how I built my success, Gordon. I, I, you go to my events, I've got, you know close to five thousand people at my last championships i made sure i shook a hand and, and picture of everyone that day from eight in the morning to ten at night and they come back numerous times to every time they win a trophy award and that personal touch is what it's all about and i kept my closed up south closed off from the martial arts world for a reason because the, i felt i was treated wrong in my early 20s and i didn't want to be done with that now bob was chucking me on the front cover, cover of the magazines all the time because he knew obviously he loved the controversy of me he was unknown and he was skeptical to me at first but he said to me i want you to come up to huddersfield i want you to spar with me and and prove your case and uh you see how you get on and then if you get on well i want to stick you on the front cover of martial arts illustrated and for every kid that's that's, that's my dream yeah. you know and uh i drove to huddersfield and, and uh, literally man he kicked the hell out of me <laughs> he was awesome that guy but at the end of it he shook my hand and he bowed to me and he put me on the front cover and then I had everyone turn that up. But yeah, and going back to that event in that queue for people wanting to have pictures, and there's people like Sandy Holt and stuff who I've grown up admiring, you know, watching him. On, on, and I'm like, well, you want a picture of me? Are you are my childhood idol. I don't get it. Yeah. You know, his funny hair is sticking out. We're still stay in contact now. And uh, 
you know, a massive scan and stuff. I mean, all these people I've looked up to, and uh, yeah, I just, I just felt I was mistreated, Gord, if I'm honest. Um, but now I look, I know, I know how, how me, I look back now at 41 years old, and I get it. I get it. I get well, it. You know what it is, um, and that's a great story, great share there, Matt, because there's a few things in there, like, like success leaves clues. Now, one of the things that is really, really important is that you are, you are, number, number one is you were very disruptive at the time. Now that takes courage. I don't care what anyone says, they can, they can say what they want, but people will go, well, it's all about the money, blah, 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 blah. No, there's courage in there to disrupt and do something different. Like when you can disrupt it, when everyone's throwing in two pound coins into a, into a bucket and you're deciding you're gonna take direct debit, i.e. standing orders, that takes courage. It takes courage to go and open a franchise. It takes courage to go and change, like go, well, you don't have to be a black belt to teach. Yeah, you, 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 as long as you're a great teacher, you can teach. If you go for a program, you can teach, which is very disruptive in a, in a martial arts uh, world. And then to go and do something that most people haven't done, and you built a personality around that, you put a brand around that. Now, people can say what they want. We'll get to the Michael Jackson thing in a minute because I think that's important you know, to, to get, get done here. But you know what it's like. like people, I totally agree with you. Like What I see, and this is where I believe sometimes martial arts schools can be artists can be closed off. They don't look at everything's yin and yang, and everyone's got good and bad. We've all got good and bad. Like You know this. There's love, there's hate. It's, it, it's all the same. But where I feel you've had, you probably had bad press is they've not, and this is what I try and champion when I, honestly, I talk about you, I'd say, look at what's great about what he does. Like the guy knows how to build a business. He knows how to build a brand. And what's more importantly, he knows about customer service. He knows how to deliver. You know, you can talk about martial arts all day long, but in fact, and what's, you know, you had this before most people got this map, right? And they're, they're coming around to this in the UK now, but you know, and I'm trying to dig this into a I'm saying they don't give a damn. I said, I don't give a crap that you've won multi-world championships. They don't give a shit. They care about what they're getting. And what you did really well, and I've got to honor you for this, at that time, you got, it's about what people want. It's always been about what people want. And if you give people what they want, they will buy. So, no, I commend you on that to be able to do that. And actually, what they want is a great instructor. Now, here's what I want to champion right here for you and, and back you here, is that I know there's... Tons and tons, thousands of martial arts black belts who are shit instructors. That's a fact, right? You cannot, there's so many martial arts instructors out there that are black, sorry, are black belts who can't instruct for topping. And I have seen this, I have, I be, like, helping lots of martial arts schoolers, hundreds if not thousands now. Every time I ask that question, everyone, I'll say, who knows, bad martial arts instructors are black belts, and they put their hands up. And, and, and it's not about being a black belt to be a great instructor and leader. It's about being a great coach. Now, some people that lift a child, they know how to lift a, a class. They know how to deliver great customer service. So I just wanted to say that, Matt, because like that, that needs to be said. You know, are you ahead of the game there? The pa parents, parents need to look at their instructor and think, that's what I want my child to represent by training in your school. As a, as a choose all qualities, are they in shape? Are they goal orientated? Are they respectful? Yep. They couldn't care less about high kicks, championships. There is a place for that, Gordon. There, there's like a 10% uh, membership. We, that's why we do our championships. Yeah. Uh, and they're only, they only care about what are you going to do for my kid or what are you going to do for me to help me lose weight? Yeah, what are you going to do for me to help me become more confident? You know? And more importantly, Matt, I love that. And also, how they connect with you. Let's be honest and let's be raw here. There are so many black belt instructors out there, instructors who have an ego. And that ego comes in contact with a you know, parent, a student, and it's like, well, I am here. Now I know that you will not guarantee this, and I don't know how you win the school. I can guarantee you approachable. I can guarantee you a person that people can relate to. I can guarantee that your instructors that you have in your organization are approachable, they get it, they're all there for their people. I know that and I don't even know you. I know that's a fact because people buy from people. And, and many martial arts, you can learn like, so if you're listening on the podcast here or watching the live stream, like learn from Matt in this area because it doesn't matter how great you are at martial arts. It doesn't, it really doesn't. It, what matters is your, how you serve the people that are standing in front of you. And and I think you you know you, you've proven that Matt. I mean you've got you know you say you got how many how many members do you think you've got? You got a thousand low like, a thousand how many records you've got over your whole association? Over a hundred thousand, easy. 
100,000. Yeah. Yeah. 100,000. And here's the thing. I, I looked into this, right? Okay, because I got caught up in that years ago. Oh, Matt Phillips, well, you know, all this, bro, okay? But I'm open-minded enough to go and do my due do, 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 diligence. Wow, that is hard to say, right? Um, um, but I did, Matt, and I went and had a look. And what I looked for was, right, okay, what is what is um what's the magic here what are they doing what's matt doing that is great i remember looking at your website years ago matt with your flying psychic with your ponytail here i'm going this guy's got it the website was amazing i think this guy gets marketing and branding like i don't and he's got the flying psychic going on there the brand the look the feel i thought the website was amazing but i had a look and i was just like what is there so, it yeah. is there. Must be sick of the kicks. He's in there. He's in there, right? And 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 I was like, "What's this guy doing? It's great." And then I looked. I was like, "Go and research your." And I go and have a look around your different martial arts school owners. And what became apparent is within what they were doing, lots of people had a lot of respect for what Matt, Matt Fidesz martial arts schools were doing. So it's like, well, I'm sorry. And 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 you know, the main pushback was from martial artists in the UK. You know, that was the big pushback for you, wasn't it? And, uh, and and that's everyone's right. They can do what they want. But that's when you look at it, you think, well, actually, 100,000 people, Matt Fidesz is branding his people. They're clearly doing something right. You don't have 100,000 students, by the way, if you're doing anything wrong. And number two, here's what's really important, is that you're helping change them ch children's and adults' lives through what you do. And that, for me, is important. Doesn't matter what the standard and what, whatever people want to throw out there, because I don't believe that's true anyway. But but that's what people throw out there. You know it. I'm just going to speak real, real. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but what you are doing is, and I've looked at it, and the people they love what you do, and they they feel inspired and motivated. So I just wanted to put that. Out. That is really important, you know, to say in this interview. It's true, Gordy, and you're not going to be around in business 24 years later and still growing if you're not giving the public what they want. And uh, do you know what? It's all changed now. I have to admit, with the martial arts world, in uh, 15 years ago, it was tough going. It was tough going. And some things did get to me. You wouldn't have seen it, but it did get to me. The comments I'd read on the forums and stuff like that. Um, and my friends would say, just don't read it. They're, they're, they're your free publicists. And they're the ones who created the attraction for people to inquire about what the hell is this guy doing who bought franchises. Mm. And across my network, too. They, I cast them as a family. They, all of my franchisees are my family. It's, we call it the MF family, and I'll do anything for them. And at the start of the lockdown, I got on a Zoom in the mall, midnight, and they were all there looking for me for the magic answer. I didn't have the magic answer. But what I did say to them, I'm mostly secure financially. I've got my property, which is very, very successful. We have a, over 100 properties there. Um, by to let some, half from HMOs. I'm, I'm financially secure. Guys, not one of you on this Zoom is going to go broke, lose your home, not be able to eat, or you're going to come out of this because I'm going to financially back you for it. And I said, not only that, I'm going to fund your marketing because I know at the end of this lockdown one that we're talking about that you're probably not going to have any money. You're not going to have enough money to, to, to advertise and get out there. So I used my, my own money, well over £150,000 of my own personal funds. I kept my word and pulled them all back. Now we lost 37%. Doesn't sound like a lot. Well, that's 37,000 members. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah. and we pulled them all back within six weeks. I, and I also gave them free uniforms out of my own money as well. So I, I shown them and proved to them how much they mean to me. And I, I know their kids' names, I know what they're doing. Um, I pay for some of their medical bills when they have problems like to go private. I go the extra mile for them all, and they know I'm there for them. It's not just about paying me a percentage to be part of my brand. It's they're, they're, I'm there for them as they're like a brother, of, um, father figure, or whatever, their mentor. And uh, I, I go, it's much more than just uh, um, martial arts or Pilates or yoga or dance franchises. It's, it's that they're, they're part of a brand. That, that would guarantee them if they got in trouble i would fight their corner if they got in legal trouble i'll be there for them and i, I have been too i funded properties for some of them so they can get on it quick and get remortgages of you know you know i find out someone's ill then i'll call them and for throughout throughout the years too even like happy birthday messages i i must do 30 to 50 of them a day i've got no problem with that of doing that and bringing up a member and they, they get all shocked that i've called them and that their instructors made that contact with me and i'm on the phone talking to their kid 
saying happy birthday. That's how you build a brand. That's this, how you build. Mate, I just got to commend you there. Um, that is absolutely phenomenal. £150,000 of your own money. So people will go, well, it's all right, we can afford it. Yeah, that's not the point. It's not the point. It's actually going out and wanting to do that, getting on and supporting people. Like, you know, like guys, if you're lit, when you guys are listening to this right now, I want you to really take stock of what Matt's doing here. You understand why he's so successful. He's successful because he cares. You can't get successful if you don't care, especially in something like a community based business like martial arts. Is. He cares for his franchisees. He wants to back them. He's there for them, you know. And I'm, I, you know, I think it's amazing. And 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 here's the thing, guys. I've said, and, and you'll love this, by the way, uh, Matt. I tell people to do video birthday messages for, for uh, just how long does it take? It takes a couple of seconds. I, here's the thing. I teach it. I tell people to do it. How many think you do it? Hardly any. Why? Because they can't bother or they're too busy. You're taking the time out to do that every single day. Powerful thing you can do. If you hear a kid sick, get, get on the phone to them, you know, and go that extra mile. They're not expecting it. And it, it just blows them away. I do it because I just love it. You know, I, I love the reaction. It makes me feel like I've achieved something out of my career. Because it's not the money and the, the flashy cars and this credible house and all that stuff. It, we're, we're all we're all going to end up in a box one day. Girl. We can't take it with us. And like you were right earlier on. I never focused on the money. The money I was always taught by Nick Kikinas, who's my mentor. And he was yeah. quite out of me at that point. Is that focus on student we call it student service customer service basically focus on incredible student service money will be the byproduct to that i've never focused on the money the money came because i provided flipping incredible damn classes that if people you know people actually did turn up in the air some of my biggest critics turned up took part in some of my classes who i read these guys of people i read about in the magazines and um they took part in the classes and i'm like geez man that was amazing i can see why you're putting people in and uh, yeah, they just, it's not that hard guys. You just got to model what, what I've done. But what I did get right was I learned the value of branding, PR and marketing yes. and that we're not in the business of, if you want to teach martial arts, it's great. You can be the best teacher in the world, but if you haven't got members to teach in the first place, you've got a serious problem. So unless you can sell, unless you can market, unless you can build a brand, and it's even harder in today's world because back then, Gordon, we didn't even have like a DBS checks or anything. You could just go out and hire a hall. They didn't ask any questions. Now, because of the – since Holly and Jessica, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, that's when DBS checks first came in. And now, now because of the, you know, the world is so, so on to pedophiles and stuff like that, anything to do with kids, they, will, they would rather go with a well-known established brand with social proof because Google's around now. Your whole life's in there, like it or not. Yeah. Good, yeah. bad, and ugly, it's in there. Or are they going to go with the starter? Now, if you're going to be a starter in these days, then you've got a choice. You can either associate yourself to people who have been around for a long time and follow the model, or you can try and work it all out yourself. And good luck with that. I, don't, it, I honestly believe, and I've always said, I'm always very honest, and it does upset people, but I always say, if I was starting off today on my own, Matt for 17 on my own today, in today's world, probably would have turned back and give up. I got a job as a personal trainer. You know, back then, it, there's a certain element of timing for sure i was one of the first but uh the younger you are the more hungry you are for success you got to keep that hunger going and some of my successful friends make an effort um to to stay childlike and to stay hungry uh, for success to to be out it's all about for me leaving something behind as a legacy for my kids because i think the world's going to be a tough place mm. where my children and their children so it's about leaving something behind to take care of them when i'm not here that will be around forever that's what it is and my franchises know too that you know obviously financial goals is important we there isn't there isn't the biggest cause of divorce is, is uh financial problems stress is financial problems antidepressant there's there is no romance about finance guys i'm sorry if you don't like that but that is very true you know I mean, i'm a kid I'm, I'm 41 years old you see my missus she's gorgeous she's 27 right i i would not have attracted someone like that if i wasn't successful and confident and a leader and stuff i know that you know there's no way it's uh i also attract a lot of the opposite people who want to be my friend for the wrong reasons i have to be very wary of but the yeah the, the whole concept of you've got to be humble you, you have to be um a personal brand you have to be they have to know like and trust you and be approachable yep. for my franchises no when i go and take mf plc which i will and I will make 
hundreds of millions of pounds. They will too on the back of me. They'll, they'll come with me on that journey. And that's not because they're doing it for the money. It's because they're doing it because they're going to be left the legacy for their kids and they'll never have to worry about money again. And I'm sorry, people say they're not interested in the money. Well, really? I think yeah. lockdown, one, lockdown one, they learned they were worried about money because a lot of the big players on the phone to me saying, any chance you can jump on this podcast? Because they were looking for the answers. They saw how vulnerable they are. 100%. 100%. You've got to build those pillars in place so that you're always financially there. You've got to get to six-figure income, then you need to invest to get passive income, and then you'd set up for life. And my franchises understand that, and I teach them that stuff. And when I when I, when I I really make it one day, when we PLC, which will be probably in the next five, six years or so, then they'll come with me on that journey and because they get initial public offering the day before. They'll be in there, and they'll, they'll, they'll all become multi-millionaires set up for life most of us set up for life anyway but really set up for life you know and and they're, they're on that journey with me so I think uh, it's brilliant Matt I think it's great and what we're talking about here is going to open people's eyes no doubt you know they're going to listen to what you're saying here and it's way bigger than most people are doing like in the sense of what you're thinking how you're thinking and you know you're a kid who's come from uh nothing at school like you just weren't you what you told me um you don't i don't know if you that people know i don't know if you want to share what you shared me the other day about writing i don't know whether you want to share that uh, but you know I mean, you want. yeah sure yeah you see we're dyslexic you can't read is that right oh, yeah? yeah yeah okay yeah cool yeah i can't write yeah i can't write you can't write yeah. i don't know what Lord. i i've kept that a secret for i don't know 20 years and the only reason i decided to come out and talk about it is because i saw uh Harry Redknapp on Piers Morgan talk about the same thing and yeah. how it was received. And I thought, you know, what's the point? Because it's quite difficult for me because when I check into hotels and stuff, uh, i got to fill out the forms. I cannot fill them out. Yeah. What am I supposed to say at that point? So I have to pass it to my wife. Yeah. And then she feels that we have like a strategy to try and hide that process. Yeah. I, all I, I don't need to be able to write. That's the strange thing. I sign autographs and sign things. That's literally all I have to do. Uh, I, I, there is never a situation. Like, I remember when I first met Monique in South Africa, and I wrote notes to myself. Well, I can understand. Well, it looks like hydroglyphics to anyone else, but um, I can understand what they are. She came She came in into my room and said, who's been in here? What child's been here and wrote that? You know, And I was really hurt by it, and I thought, wow, oh, dear me. And I didn't want to admit to her at the time it was me. And over time, she realized it was my, my um, handwriting. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't. Well, basically, the nuts and shell of it is that um, they assumed I was right-handed at school, and then they realized at 12 years old I was actually left-handed. I should have realized myself because I was kicking with my left leg and stuff and kicking footballs with my left leg and things. And they tried to get specialists to help me with, my, my, uh, with like special gadgets and stuff to write, but it was too late by that point. Um, I, I can't spell very well. Uh, my grammar is appalling. But someone attacked me on Instagram the other day, so I was talking about what I do, and they're like, you can't spell and uh, write. You need to, before you advise people, you need to learn how to spell and uh, ground write. And I, and I wrote back, and that's exactly why I'm successful, man. I'm doing what the others don't. <laughs> and man, and Dave, Dave Holland jumped on it then, too, and I attacked him as well. Uh, some, who did? Dave Holland. Oh, brilliant. And you know what, mate? Like, you know, and it's important that you share that. You can't write, you know, you're, you're dyslexic, you can't, you can't write. It doesn't matter. And this, it like, like, and that's inspirational, mate. That's why you should share that because it gives, it shows the real who you are, you know, and I think it's really important. I really thank you for sharing that on here because it's important, you know, success, you know, what would you define here that's made you successful? Like, tell me, the, give me, give me some of the things that you believe has helped you become successful. Um, mindset is the key to everything and also communication is the mother of skill it's hugely i i was around an inner circle at a very young age who were talking about ideas and great things and they were all billionaires or multi-millionaires mm. it was not a normal transition into adult life while my friends at 18 were going to nightclubs and things i was hanging around with some of the biggest names in the entertainment and business world that is going to have a knock-on effect on your life. I didn't realize at the time what it would happen, how it was happening, but um, of course it would. And if you spend your life mixing with those people, you will become those people. You, your gestures, how you talk, and um, how you think and stuff. So I couldn't care less what the martial arts industry was saying about me, um, because these other people were saying to me at the time, "Oh, you're doing good. You got to worry about it." 
when they stop talking about you yeah keep keep it going matt keep it controversial because that's how you're gonna get people talking about you become a brand mm. become a become a big name and you're going to attract franchises to you. You're going to attract members because it was something. These guys who are talking about you so bad or good, then you must be doing something so they come and check you out. They meet you, and all these people who uh, have got their opinion about me, they never met me. They've never trained with me. They wouldn't stand a chance, man, if they spied against. I'm sorry, guys, but you wouldn't. Even now, at 41, I could still do. <laughs> you all got beer bellies. Some of them have and stuff, and they're, they're all hiding behind their computers and things. Yeah. You know, the fact is, is that myself and Lee, who got a lot of stick as well, they always say, Lee dog takes the fawns. Jeez, man, I took some flipping fawns in the early years. But the fact is, these guys, they couldn't mind. You know, they're the ones, they were in the probably 50s and 60s now. I've seen them out of shape. And not, I'm not going to disrespect them for what, they're, what they were taught by their instructors and stuff. But as a martial artist, you've got to show a bit of respect here. Things change in time. It's not like it was 2,000 years ago. you got to adapt. we got guns now, man. We, you, can, you can't defend yourself against a flipping knife. If someone's coming at you with a knife, you got to turn around and run. That's your best defense. You can't all these crazy moves to trying to go a knife and stuff. It's just, it's just ridiculous. What they want is pure, solid, honest education. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you know, God, we talked about this. And people with me, they always see the glamour – uh, glitzy side. What they don't see is that I have gone through a school of hard knocks education and in 2009 things, people used to say to me, when my, I did very well, I, I sold my, um, I had a martial arts, I spent into Germany and we sold 118 franchises in one night and it was incredible, uh, 12,000 euros a pop and then about 18 months later I decided that this ain't a uh, uh, it's difficult with the language problem and stuff and things. Um, and a company come and wanted to meet me called 24 Hour Fitness. And they came over and they put an offer on the table. And the guy, it's been, it's been in the media at the time. It was a, it was a big story. He paid 1.4 million uh, to me at the time, uh, euros, I think it was. And I was only like 23 for, for the network. And he changed the brand name from MF to a different brand name. And it crashed and burned within 18 months because he didn't have that drive like I had behind it. You know, you got to have that drive. You do it on your own. You're alone. He didn't have the social proof and stuff. It and it was sad to see it crash and burn, but I had all the, the money, which I invested in the properties and stuff. But he taught me a very important lesson, which I didn't believe. I drove After the deal was done, I was driving him back to the airport for his flight back to Germany. And he said to me, you know what, Matt? Everything you touch in a minute turns to gold. Something will go wrong eventually. Um, so be careful for that. You know, something will go wrong. And I said, nah, nothing's going to go wrong, man. I read the right books. I mix with the right people. I've got the powerful friend. I stay in shape. You know, um, everything's fine. And he was so right. Because in 2009, I was on antidepressants. I was on sleeping tablets. I was on uh, Valium, sedatives. I was the loneliest flipping man in the world, I felt. You know, in mansions with with these incredible cars on the drive, and some of your friends have been to my my house then too. It's insane to have a house like that at twenty years old. Um, and the reason being is that everything just came at once. One of, one of my friends died in a tragic way. Then my due to my de dedication, not getting a life balance right, with my three daughters and my my ex wife, who, who I get on very well with, by the way, she's wonderful. Um, I, you know, I didn't give her the, the respect. I was just obsessed with my career, obsessed. 5 a.m. to 11 o'clock at night, sometimes 2 or 3 in the morning, not seeing her or the kids, not, you know. And when I did that show, Rich House, Poor House, I was honest in that. And I said, look, the reason for my marriage breakdown was because I was too obsessed with my my fame, success and uh, at the time. And I, and I didn't get the balance right. So she wanted a divorce. So that, and I thought, I missed a big shot. I got the money and powerful friends. I get the best barrister. Hey, I don't work man in the court. It's not on the man side. <laughs> hey. So yeah, I tried to keep the children with me, hire a big shot barrister uh, who works at like big shot people like Tom Cruise and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I, I lost the kids to her. I, got, I saw them like once every two weeks for the court order. All my assets got frozen because the way it works, the family court. You know, uh, even my properties got frozen, even though they're in my own name because I was too selfish enough not to put her name on them at the time. I mean, that's the way I felt, you know. Um, and then I got the, and then I got the call I, uh, that you all hope you're never going to get. I know you've been through something similar, Gordon, which is unreal. 
is that the rock the one person i had faith in me who didn't have a jealous motive or anything who said always said to me you know i used to go to her and say you know mum why is my life strange why you know why is is it weird what's happened to me because my brothers went down a different angle like one of my brothers I, it's just, sadly i'm not in contact with any of my brothers because this is the downside to being successful unfortunately and she said to me no you, you're not weird you're just my special son you're just special you know you, you're here for a reason to inspire people i mean she was like my rock man she she had nothing and she when my dad lost his job he became the house husband she was a legal executive she homeschooled as a as a lawyer and became a lawyer in her 30s and i looked up to her and i'd talk to her 20 times a day and bounce off the ears, the ears off her and she had to always you can do anything you want my son you don't need to have these qualifications don't listen to these people well she called me up and she said matt where are you and i said i've just yeah, can you sit down she said i've just been to the doctor so i've got six months to live and i was like jeez i just can't I, I just couldn't accept it and i wouldn't accept it i got straight on the phone she had breast cancer i got straight on the phone to uh, a professor in dublin i got my super famous best buddy to help out too to get an appointment with this person and he looked at my mum's scans and stuff and uh, um, there was trial drugs for fifty thousand pounds which i paid for and things like that and he said to me you know matt uh there's nothing we can do there's there's nothing we can do we can keep trying these drugs and they're putting my mum through a howl her skin was peeling off she was going to side effects with this chemo it was unreal um anyway she she, she we could we call it the dark three years of my life basically from 2009 to 2012 we, we lost her then we she wanted me to come and see her she was in kidderminster at the time um and her and my stepdad were in the living room she said I, I want you to make a decision as my eldest son uh about my future i don't want to be going through this pain i want quality of life so there's this new drug that can come out they may give me six months or the drug they tell me if i come off all drugs i'll be able to see my daughter her grandchildren and that's a quality time view for maybe another month and that's what i'd rather and, and i respected her wish it was the hardest conversation ever you know we, we went and picked the coffin with her where she wanted to be buried she was so brave i'll take my hat off to my mother she picked the site she wanted to be buried in uh she wanted a white coffin you know she didn't want it she didn't want to the norm that's my mum. cost me an absolute thought we want to make sure it was lead proof because she's worried about i mean we talked about all these things and then when she went it was a blow i mean i was like wow i'm on my own on this planet now i've got no wife i can only see my kids in line with a kids access order i've uh weekends i used to dread friday so i used to go back to the mansion of the house wander around this big place at three o'clock in the morning didn't trust anyone you try meeting a girlfriend when you meet at that age too when your best friends are like the most famous men in the world they they know anything about you i've got some preconceived idea about you from gossip or what google says you sit down with a girl and they uh they they just want to talk about one thing which is my friends my famous friends and my career it was hard to get that trust i remember one girl i became really attached to and when it got to the point where we're going to get jiggy right she had on her calf muscle she had uh, a a tattoo a permanent tattoo of my best friend that who just passed away in a in a in a dancing type position and it freaked me out a little bit you know i was like whoa you told me you didn't you wouldn't care about it. it turned out she was one of his biggest fans you know i still got jiggy with her stuff but i didn't speak to her again. <laughs> <laughs> i gotta be honest you know but uh yeah spending christmas i mean christmas was just like the most painful it was two in a row for some reason i would always split up with a girl around november and then yeah one christmas we was i was snow there was just too much snow and i'd normally go and spend it with my mum up in kidderminster while i was single and uh I just couldn't face it, Gordon, because my mum used to make Christmas so special for me and my brothers. It was a big deal in our family. We used to love it, the warm feeling. And the music used to trigger off memory. So, and I didn't want people to find me either because I've got, I got close friends. I've got a very close manager who knows where all my properties, I don't know where all my properties are. I've never visited most of my. He knows where they are. He knows what they're doing. I can trust him in my life. And he was worried about my health. And he was worried that he'll find me dead in bed one day you know that was you check on me every morning make sure i'm up and um you, you know got my mindset right and stuff but on the 17th of december we we shut down our schools and and then we don't normally open up to around about the 6th or 7th of january now i was concerned because uh i knew from the 17th of december to the 6th of january i would see no one 
at all. It wasn't my turn to have the kids at Christmas. So, um, yeah, I, what, I didn't want people to give me the whole sympathy thing, so I hated that. And that's that's kind of normal. When, when you're in trouble, you push people away. Yeah. And some of my franchises were trying to get to me, uh, but they couldn't get past the electric gates. And, and I knew they were going to try and get to me, especially at Christmas time. So I checked into a hotel. I turned my phone off. I'm not proud of it at all. But I, from the day before Christmas Eve to uh, just after New Year's, I literally just slept through it with uh, by alcohol, sleeping tablets, and antidepressants. I used to slept through the whole thing. I must have worried my mum to, to heck. And I know my friends are trying to get hold of me. And I stayed in the hotel so no one could track me down. And uh, I just, you know, they used to pop out every now and again. And it's totally against what I preach and what I'm about, but I just couldn't bear it. And I was snowed in. I couldn't go and see mum for that reason. Now, the second year, I did the same thing again. Just couldn't bear it being Christmas. Uh, I had the, the, my my daughters in the morning. I can't cook or nothing. You see me on Rich House, poor house. I'm, I'm an idiot when it comes to cooking. But <laughs> I, I did like the microwave spaghetti bolognese. They still remember it to this day. They loved it. And I dropped them off at my ex-wife's uh, house. And uh, bless her, she she sneaked around the back and she gave me a roast dinner, you know, with foil on it. She said, don't tell my mum and dad or nothing. We're not, not supposed to be on good terms because our lawyers are like attacking the, the fortune. And um, so she gave me that. And, I, and I, I was eating it on my own at the house. I took a picture, selfie, I've still got it to this day. Of And I, was, I actually messaged my mum. I said, Do you think it's safe to eat this? Maybe she's put something in it so that I'm not going to turn up the court in a few weeks' time, you know, for the divorce final hearing. But no, I, after that, I checked into the hotel and I just slept through it again using medication. Um, and then I was on antidepressants and sleeping tablets and stuff. Um, and before mum died, my agent for the showbiz side of things was ex concerned about me because I was getting battered by the media all the time and totally to do with my famous buddy and accusing me of fathering one of his kids and all this stuff and driving me insane. I just couldn't get away from it. And I didn't want this in my life at the time. I needed to spend time working with my franchises and and uh, my, spending my kids and spending time with my mum. My mum was going. My agent said, listen, I'm going to South Africa. Uh, I need you to get you out of the country, get your head straight. And he's looking at a pop star over there. She's like the Britney Spears of South Africa. Um, come and chill out by the hotel and um, by the pool. Get your head right because you've got a lot to deal with. When your mum goes, it's going to hit you hard. And then watch these tablets, man, because the doctors would – you. Literally, I literally got five minutes with a doctor and then – quick time to give you a prescription and you go back to give you another one and the other one has a looked at the file before you know it you're like on so much stuff it's unreal i was on like four or five different antidepressants and that the rz pam thing is a terrible thing i was just like a walking zombie i was described at the time no no functionality at all when i got to south africa you know of course things changed then um i met monique she was the client of that my agent was represented she was on tour and her bodyguards were stay at the hotel with her. Totally different to the way I've been raised, you know, like, you know, dating reality stars, glamour models. I had a famous glamour model I, I lived with a month before I met her. Um, you know, you, literally, you get jiggy on the first night while we're with Monique. Is there's none of that until you know you don't leave the house and you don't date or sleep with anyone until you're married. I was in the spare room. Literally, that's the way it works. And if if you go out on a date, the parent comes with you because that's the way her religion is out there, the culture out there. And for me, it was a bit weird because she was nineteen. I thought, God, this is not like it. I'm not used to this. I remember her. Her um, once we left the hotel, they asked me to come to stay at their house, and then her. I was in the spare room, and then her mum said, "I think it's time you you stayed in in Monique's room." And I was like, "Oh yeah, about Thank time." <laughs> it's, been, it's been three weeks. This is not right. About time, and then they, uh, I get into Monique's room, get all excited. Yeah, man, this is just, uh, should be for me. And then the Monique comes in, gives me a kiss, and says, "Okay, I'll see you in the morning." I said, "Where are you going?" So my mum and dad have put a put a bed, put a bed in in their room. They just want you to have my bed because it's more comfortable and bigger. And I, she shut the door, and I'm thinking, "What am I doing? 32 years old, 19 year old virgin." I Three weeks later, and I still haven't pulled her properly. <laughs> I called up my mum, who's just alive, you're still still alive and doing okay. And she said, uh, that's the way it should be, son. You know, that's why your grandparents were married for 76 years and, and stuff. Respect it. That's the that's the way it should be. And and you're doing the right thing. Anyway, we 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 got engaged. Uh we got engaged. Uh, I flew out there on April 24th. We got engaged on May the 18th, which is my birthday. And you gotta do a proposal out there in front of the whole family. And, and she still isn't able to 
to leave the house or, uh, or go and stay in like a hotel or be alone or anything like that. It's not the way it works. And then we got married a few months later. And uh, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I couldn't wait to get back to the hotel room that night, you know, as you can imagine. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's amazing, like sharing that. Like people won't know the chat. Like everyone has, I mean, what I've taken from that, and thank you so much for sharing that because I think a lot of people will be listening to that going, wow, I did not know that. You know, you've, everyone sees the glitz, the glamour, don't they? The money, the car, the, the, all of that stuff and the Michael Jackson thing and all of that stuff, right? But they don't know it's a person behind all of that. And we all go through our challenges and we've all got our difficulties and we're all, all work like, as Jim Rohn says, that the same wind blows on us all. It's just in different directions sometimes. You know, you're going, it's never all plain sailing. It's never all positive, you know? And I think that, that you know, Thank you for sharing that because that's going to. Cool, cool. I, I, I tell you straight, man. And, and I, I th I'm hoping it'll inspire and help some people. I, I tried taking my life during that period four times, and I ended up in hospital in every one. And clearly, I wasn't very good at it. I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> you need to get better at that, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was, it was ironic for people to try and understand it because if you look at my fortune and success and my my network and what i drive the house i had at the time didn't mean nothing when you're lowering your mat yeah i know you sadly lost your dad not long ago when you're lowering your parent into the ground all that stuff don't matter anymore mm -hmm. and then you walk away you think okay it's just me now i'm not in touch with the rest of my family i'm on this planet alone and that is a scary place to be mm -hmm. and my reaction to that is i don't want to be alone anymore I, I can't trust people. People just got an agenda all the time. I can't put up with this hate anymore. Um, they're supposed to be free PR. You know, I just I don't want any more success. I don't want any more money. And I, yeah, I tried, especially at night times, it was just difficult for me through the medication side of it. I just didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to wake up. And I, and I was a bit of a wimp with it. I could have done it properly if I wanted to. But, you know, I just did, I just did, I wanted to go to sleep and not wake up. I couldn't deal. When I'm asleep, I'm not dealing with the pain anymore. I'm not dealing with that horrendous pain. Of being a lonely man with my mum who's gone at 56 years old, no family, due to maybe some decisions I've made, being a bit cocky when I was younger and stuff, and maybe not looking at it from their point of view and trying to get them to understand why I've got this weird life and they haven't, and looking out for them a bit more. Um, so, you know, I take some uh, some fault on that for sure, is on my, my side. Um, I've got no relationship with my father because we just got nothing in common. I mean, it's very difficult for him too, and I didn't really understand that. He comes from a get a trade background. He couldn't understand why his son was on the media and getting all this, and why why I would want that in the first place, you know. And so yeah, it's uh, it ain't all rosy. But Monique was amazing because what she did is she took me under her wing. She couldn't care less about the money because the way she'd been brought up. She understood the fame side and the gossip because she was the number one sad and pop star in South Africa. She still is now. She's number one now, as you probably you're aware. I think still out there and um she got all that she understood i had to react to things and media reports would be false about me she understood that i have to react to things at 11 o'clock at night because it's the way it works and when i'm out i have to give the public time in the middle of dinner they will walk up to you and they will expect to have a conversation or have a picture and you, and you talk about michael his fans all around the world so they come up to you they they're, they're fascinated that they meet someone who's actually touched michael jackson's hand and they want to yeah. yeah honestly every day i go out there's some kind of a reaction to that or from my own tv work or what i do or, or uh, the body of the fitness industry want to high five you you know and then have a picture my my, my older daughter is there, especially one of them she gets embarrassed by it and walks off but but really i know she loves it really it's funny actually now she's trying to launch up her own uh, makeup business she wants to do it in the media suddenly her daddy's <laughs> suddenly her daddy's sounds like a great great load of fun i can imagine <laughs> now she likes it that her daddy's Matt for there, so she's got an Instagram account and all my followers. <laughs> yeah. and, she, and she's like, oh, dad, you know, I, I can open doors to to her and that. Although she, I, I want her to make it for herself. But no, it's not all being rosy, but you don't hear about my downfalls. You only hear about my successes. And maybe it was a fault of mine. My franchise is known. I think they appreciate that, that we go through rough times. And but yeah, I was, was I cocky in early 20s? Yeah, of course I was. Of course I was a cocky dude. What, how can you not be when you're making that kind of eighty thousand pound a month plus? Well, I think by the time I was twenty with my five schools, I was over a hundred thousand a month, um, and it got to a point where I didn't really have to do a lot as well. I just worked out and trained, and drove around in my Ferraris and, and things, and uh, 
of course, of course, you know, you're going to be cocky. And it's not a lesson I can teach people. I'm afraid I've tried. I, t I keep saying to them, don't buy a Ferrari. Don't do this. You, you will be cocky. There will be downsides. It's going to happen. It's not going to be gold. You can't teach that stuff, Gordon. It's like Kim Stones used to say to me, Matt, stop doing the side splits all the time. Stop doing the, you know, the, the you know the flying kick in the background. That's what I'm, I'm known for in the martial arts industry. Probably the only thing the martial arts industry gave me credit for, if I'm honest, <laughs> is my kicking skills. Bob Sykes said I was one of the greatest kickers there is, me and Lee Charles. And I just love, I've got long legs. That's an advantage. A guy with short legs, it wouldn't look so good. But the flying kick is something I really want to perfect. It's like an image of mine. And Kim Stones, who's a world champion in Taekwondo, used to say, he must have been 40 then, and I was 20. So, Matt, listen to me. Please stop doing side splits and stuff because uh you've got no need to do it and when you get older you're gonna you're gonna need hip replacements and stuff like that and i'm like no nah, no nah, nah, i'll be you know cocky i'm fine what, what happened to me kim he's had he just had his hips replaced uh a couple of years ago and i'm gonna have, to have mine replaced he was right and it's lessons you can't teach and i wish if someone could take anything away from this it's just it's the school of hard knocks is the biggest education room out there and if you could just listen to the downside not just a success don't chase the money in the dream Look at from people like me and you, Gordon, too, because I know you're a massive role model for people out there in the martial arts world or outside the martial arts world. Look at the stuff that I've been through. Respect your wife. Put your family first. Put your children first. You'll never get time back. I regret that big time. I would trade the, the uh, time back and give away the money to spend those years with my three daughters and, um, and so on. Now, the, the thing with the ex-wife, we got on really, really well now. And my wife and her are like best buddies. Just last week, it was weird. I did like the Borat thing because they're putting furniture together here. And I got, a, I did like a video saying, this is my wife. This is my second wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they were laughing their heads off, you know, because, uh, yeah, she's, she's 10 years, so seven, eight years older than me, my ex-wife is. But uh, we don't have, I've got six children in my world. We don't have this half-brother, half-sister thing. My younger three don't know any different um if my wife wants advice she rings her and it's quite weird sometimes because they they ring each other about oh you know what how do i handle matt in this situation i'm like <laughs> oh, I'm freaking out here and then her husband he works on my house and my my um, properties as the main stuff she went and got married again and people find it weird because uh if they speak bad of me they've got no idea he's the stepfather to my children and that he also we're on good terms but yeah, you just got to learn. Do you know one thing I learned years ago? I don't want to name drop, but I'm sure you heard of Quincy Jones, yeah. who's a famous producer. And he achieved the impossible. And this is what I've seen in the martial arts now too. It's where everyone's come together. He got the biggest names in the world, pop music, all hated each other, all had a problem with each other, all competed together, and got them together in a room to make a single called Heal, uh, sorry, We Are The World. Do you remember that? Yeah. To, to raise money for... Um, um, AIDS and stuff in, in Africa and he put a sign up on the door and before before these mega stars we're talking like big time Diana Ross Lionel Richie who all competitors against each other put a sign up on the door saying before you leave when you enter this room leave your egos here that's what he wrote he put on a big sign and it worked he pulled it off he pulled off the impossible he had every big name there all singing together on we are the world which raised you know millions and millions and millions and millions and it, that, that really hit home with me thinking if the martial arts world could just leave park the egos and i had the ego back then they could just park it and learn from me and if you want to be successful that's fine don't bitch and moan about everybody else just look at what are they doing that you that can help you may not want to be have the crazy like i wouldn't if i could go back i wouldn't have what i wouldn't um I would do things a bit differently. I wouldn't want to be where I am now with this monster of a of a of a business because uh, there is a downside to that when it when it comes to having to react to things even on Christmas Day. You, you really have to to have a sacrifice of your freedom and stuff. You know, even if you go and stay at a hotel at another country, you, even like we went to Turkey last year. Uh, sorry, year before like last year didn't even happen, and um, it just takes one English person to know recognize you and then your holiday is ruined because that dinner in the dinner tables and stuff all day he asked that guy there who's uh used to work for with mj and it was on rich house poor house on this morning and and then the whole week that comes people gossiping about you and you're trying to sunbathe and they want a picture so there's a downside to this whole thing of being a mega success you gotta find the balance 
you've got to be very clear, clear what you want out of your life. If you want a good family life, then you need to make that a priority. If you want mega success, you're gonna you're not gonna get the balance right. What I've learned now is to get the balance perfectly right. That program taught me that actually. That rich house. I just thought it was gonna be another TV show. Actually taught me about the power of they are just as happy as I am, and they're living in a small terrace council estate with no money of living off 110 pound a week. They were happy to leave my mansion, my Bentley, living off, what did I, I don't know, I can't remember, five grand a week or something at the high class hotels. They were happy to get home. And they were, and I got back and I realized they were happier than me because they had the time with their kids and stuff. And my kids, they embraced the little action figures. They didn't have all the PlayStations and stuff like that. They couldn't afford it. But they, well, I took them to Hamley's um, as a treat, Gordon. This, this is, Michael did it to my children. He took them, to, we shut down Hamley's because he can't, we couldn't really go turn up places with him. It was difficult. So Hamleys, they shut down Hamleys for us. And he said to my um, my stepsons, have any any you want, off you go. And they and they came back with just two toys. He says, That's all is that all you want? And they turned to me and said, Is that all they want, Matt? And I said, Yeah, I guess they're, they're not they're not used to that, you know. Yeah. And then I, I wanted to have that family from Rich House, poor house, the Lehman. So I said, Let's go to London. And I took them to London. Now they didn't shut the Hamleys down from here. That's when I had that down. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a whole different world, man. When Michael died, it was probably a different world. But going to Euro Disney was a different experience to what I used to. But um, I went to Hamleys and I said to the family, "Listen, I want to do something for you guys, for for uh, for the two children, Freddie and Olivia. Anything you want, off you go. Anything you want." And and I, I had to push them to spend my money. I had to really push them, you know. And uh, and it just shows you what what's important is what's under the roof in your head. And you got to be so have such clarity on what your outcome is. Life goes quick in a heartbeat. It's only it only seems like yesterday when I was 18, 19, 20. I thought being 41 would be so far away. Like starting a pension off at 20, I thought was deeply bizarre. Uh, but now I'm thinking, well, you know, 55 isn't that far away or 60 years old. Isn't that far away anymore? It goes quick. you got to be. Ah, oh, man. We just lost Matt. Oh, good thing he's back. Let's see if he comes back. Stay with us, guys. I'm sure he will be back on. It might be his internet. Let's see if he comes back on. So um, as we're here, I mean, what a, and if you're watching live stream here, guys, what an amazing um, interview this is with a highly successful Matt Fidesz. I mean, um, love to know in your comments. Um, let me know, guys. I know there's people commenting here. What a highly um, humble guy he really is. And I, I think it's um, very, very inspiring. We'll see if we can get him back. I think his internet's um, gone out at the moment. Let's see if we can get him back in a minute. But, yeah, just uh, comment in the feed. I'd love to know your feedback on um, the interview. Um, you know, what have you, what have you learned from some of what Matt's saying? Because, you know, the guy's, you know, he's as incredible, absolutely incredible, um thanks john um he's a great guy hopefully we can get him back in a minute let me just see give okay, him what's up in a minute but yeah it's um it's amazing isn't it to listen um to someone that has a lot of media presence and a lot of people have their you know uh their opinions of matt and things they've read and etc etc but um you can tell he's a very very humble guy and um i think it's um it's been a great interview hey mate where you go let's see where he is Okay, we'll just see if he comes back online in a minute. It looks like his internet is just shot. Um, hopefully, we can get him back in a minute. We'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I mean, I look. You know, I think we should be getting him back. Hopefully, um, I'd like to carry that on with him in a minute. Uh, but yeah, great interview. Um, really, um, just loads of gold in there. If you're listening to that, when you're listening to that, guys, the gold in what Matt is saying there is incredible. Like, you know, you can tell the guy has been on a journey. You can tell there's ups, there's downs, there's, you know, there's always sunshine and darkness and rain and everyone's life has a story. And judgment for the people that we tend to give, there's always a lot more to that. So um, I, think, um, I think we can all... All agree on that. I don't know whether Matt's um, just bear with us a minute. 
it looks like his internet has completely crashed. Um, but we'll we'll see if he comes back in a minute. I'm just waiting for him to get back to me now. Um, but yeah, um, a great interview. Here he is. He's come back on. It's Here he is. Yes, we're in. It's no problem. Lockdown. This lockdown. I think the internet's been a real problem. You know, everyone's on. It's everyone's not, on Clubhouse. People are still staying that. Like, I just, I want to, um, I'll start this here because we can uh, interrupt the podcast here. So, Matt, I mean, just incredible story there. And really thank you for sharing that. And the, the gold in that and is for any of you listening here right now, and this is important, what I've taken from that is, you know, life is a journey. You will change over time from your youth to your wisdom as you get a bit older. And what I can feel from you, Matt, is like, there's things that you've done that you're probably not, you know, you may not have been, you know, you wouldn't do again, okay? There's things that you would do again. Um, and their experiences, and one of the things you said is you can't change people. You're right, they have to go through it. And you've been through your experience for a reason there, Matt. You've been through it because, you know, you can now help a lot more people because of their experiences, you know? And I think, you know, you're truly humble. Like, it's great, it's been absolutely amazing. So I'd like to just finally, if I may, um, just hit the Michael Jackson thing as well, because I think this is important because that's always the controversy, isn't it? Around your relationship with Michael Jackson, bodyguarding, et cetera, and especially in the martial arts world. So, you know, just just take us through that a little bit and just let them know like that how that all panned out with Mark, Michael Jackson. You know, what you feel, here'd be a good one, actually, what you felt you got from the martial arts industry, what happened, you know, that you had a lot of finger pointing, a lot of negative, negative press around that. How did you feel around that? And what, you know, what are your thoughts around that whole thing? It was, I think, uh, the, uh, Michael was my friend, uh, close friend, and he's introduced to me by another close friend. And it's, it's something you can't make up again, Gordon, like this fairy tale, which now I can understand it. But when you when you at the time, he was just my mate, and I I, I assumed my friends and the public would understand that which they didn't so like what's going on here this don't make any sense at all and it's uh, yeah i'll try and cut it short as i can but so when my martial arts school really kicked off well it was big news in in north devon because nothing much goes on down there and a reporter came in from an agency called southwest news and they basically stick stories on the wire and it gets picked up by newspapers if people want it and he came in and his name was nick constable um, and his kids trained up one of my schools and parents aren't silly so you got you must try and hide your success guys if you're out there they get their calculator out they know exactly what you're earning and normally they overestimate it too and he come up to, he come up to me and he said listen matt i'm a journalist and uh i'd like to interview you from the bully boy no qualifications you're clearly making a lot of money and uh take some pictures and put the story on the wire I didn't understand the why about that. And I didn't really get it. So, well, I thought it was cool, you know, like, yeah, man, I'm going to be in the, in the local newspaper or something. So he did it. And then two days later, I was the front page of every the sun, the star, the, the mail, everything you can imagine. Bully boy becomes millionaire. And I had a picture of me when I looked very cute and vulnerable and a picture of me sat in me uh, Ferrari. And, they, and the story was duplicated everywhere. And on the back of that, I did some TV shows. Called, you probably remember, uh, Trisha, remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a big launch pad for me, I think. So I did like a spinning crescent kit. It was a thing that I could do really impressive on stage. I didn't have much space to do it. And it was all about the crowd giving me a big round of applause and what I used my bully in to motivate me to be successful. And then I did Kilroy. And then I did Esther Ramson. And by that point, I was making a hell of a noise. All I wanted to be is to be in martial arts illustrated. That's all I wanted to be in. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what happened is back in the days we had the answer phones there, sat on the side of your reception at your full time of school. Um, there was an answer phone message from Yuri Geller's bodyguard. Now, Yuri Geller in England is more known for bending spoons than anything else, but he's actually he's hugely successful. I mean, his house is like a replica of the White House. I mean, it's amazing. On Sold and on Thames. He's got companies or you know, businesses and interests all around the world. He's world famous. Every country he goes, they all know who he is. Some of them he can't move around and he's that big time household name for what, 50 years. Um, he wants to meet me and discuss working with him on an anti bullying project where he does mindset and positive thinking 
and I did like some basic self defense moves. With, and back then, it was going to be given out to schools on VHS. Okay. Um, yeah, so I went to meet him. I was super impressed when his gates opened to his house. I come down. And I was like, "Wow, oh, man, this is just where I want to be. This is insane, you know. So, like gold everywhere, marble toilets. Dear me, it was just it, I, I never experienced anything like it. And I met the guy, and he was so nice. And yeah, I had half an hour with him, and then they're like, "Mr. Gellab, you got your next appointment." Um, and then we went away. I think he just saw something in me. He just saw something in me that he could. Uh, we could work together on. We ended up producing four best-selling kickboxing fitness videos um, on the back of his fame. And they were huge in Asia and, and, and other parts of the world. And then Tybo came and just blew us away. Remember the Tybo era? Yeah. 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 Lee Blanks blew us away. Yeah. Here he comes who's, who's this guy, man? He's blown us away. Um, we, we stayed very, very close friends. And I go to events with Yuri. He, uh, he bought uh, Exeter City Football Ground as well. And, um, yeah. Long story short, I knew he used to coach and consult because around the world he's, he's famous more for like a Tony Robbins figure for a uh, mindset. He's got books out like Mind Medicine um, and stuff like that, and it, and he's very good at that at NLP psychology stuff. He's awesome at that. The spoon bending thing is just one well, the thing that draws people to him, just like Tony Robbins with the firewalk. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, well, he advised big names. And I, and I I used to hear big names ringing up like presidents of certain countries and stuff. Never really took any notice of it. I certainly never heard anything to do with Michael Jackson. And uh, yeah, three o'clock in the morning, I had a phone call, which is not normal for, for super successful people. They're up and working. And Yuri's got stuff going all around the world. You've got to come to my house now. And I lived in Barstable. So from my house to his, we're talking in three and a half hours. It's like, can't, well, what's wrong? Yuri, you okay? So I can't tell you why you got to come, but if you don't come now, you regret it for the rest of your life. I was like, gee, what am I going to tell my missus, man? I, I got to tell her something. So he said, you got to come to my house. She'll understand in a few days' time. I said, how am I going to explain this to her? Can you talk to her? She said, no, I'm not getting involved. And he said, you got a Ferrari, what <laughs> moaning, get in a car, I love you, bye. Put the phone down on me. And I was like, dear man, what do I do? So we all had this massive row, my missus, as you can imagine. It's like... <laughs> Oh, you go here at three in the morning. Yeah, right. You go to Yuri Geller's house for who are you meeting there? You know, what supermodel are you meeting there? I don't know. So I, I drove there, got down to his house. Um, they let me in the, through the gates through security and uh, nothing giveaway really. There's like three SUVs, like black SUVs outside. Walk in and then go into the living room. And then this frail man walks up to me and he bows like that. Put his hand out. Said hi, nice to um, nice to meet you, Master Flesh. My name is Michael Jackson, and I'm thinking, I know you're Michael Jackson. What the hell are you doing here? I was like, pinch, <laughs> you know. And I tell you what happened. About two weeks prior to that, I went to watch Michael perform in Wembley, and he did eight shows with like 80,000 people. I was just standing there, getting squashed to death, and I and I was staring at him and admiring just the, the multi thing about what he's about, the image he created. The, the billionaire, successful, the, you know, the Beatles catalog is probably what most famous for. That was valued at billions and billions and still taking the, the time to perform. He really just loving what he did. And on the way home, we had pages back then, actually. I got a page to ring Yuri. And Yuri just wanted some feedback. I didn't know, but Michael was actually staying on and off at Yuri's house. I had no idea they were best friends. Um, but we, we we stayed up like a couple of nights and... Uh, um, we, we got on really well, and he wanted to meet me. I think Yuri put me in his life because at the time he had he had long-term security, he had retired, and he wanted to meet me because he's a martial arts fanatic, and he wanted to meet Shannon Lee and um, Linda Lee. He loved the Bruce Lee movies. He puts martial arts into his dance, if you watch it. So I, I talk about him like he's still here. I, he's a good rule of habit. And um, he would, and I and uh, Yuri knew I could make that happen, happen for a guy called uh, John Graydon and Joe Lewis, who's passed away sadly seven eight years ago now the karate champion who was friends with bruce lee so i, I made those calls and tried to set that up it's another story but the um yeah he he wanted he, he's black belt already him and his brothers are black belt his, joe jackson made them train where they were young because he felt they needed to defend himself joe was a boxer so he had this interest in martial arts and we became best buddies. Then he introduced me to a guy called Mark Lester, who played the original Oliver Twist. Remember Oliver, the little piece of crap, some more? Well, they grew up together as child stars. 
And um, we just, they, they, I used to train them. We used to, in the hotel streets, we used to move the tables away and we used to carry on training. Mark, Mark and Michael are both black belts under me. And then as time progressed on, I realized he had a difficult time with trust. I had access to all these instructors who worked for him for free. So I was never paid by the guy. I wouldn't accept any money. He used to try and offer me money. And um, yeah, I, I remember that we left Yuri's and I said goodbye to him. And I, I, I didn't have the guts to ask for a telephone number, Gordon. I just couldn't do it, you know? Uh, but he said to me, can I have your number? I'll give you a call. And I was thinking, I'm never going to hear. He's dodged a quit. I'm never going to hear from his number again, you know? His name is, is, is uh, from this bloke ever again. It's a once in a lifetime thing. And no one's going to believe me. You have the guts to ask for a picture or anything because you just can't do that in that friendship situation. And then uh, yeah, he said to me, I'm going to call you in two weeks' time and invite you to New York to stay with me because he's recording an album. Well, three weeks went past nothing. And then suddenly um, one of my staff calls me said, I was at home, and they called me from my martial arts school and said, Jesus Christ, you wouldn't believe it. This is one and a half minute long message here from Michael Jackson on the answer phone saying you've got to come to New York. It's the name he's staying under. We've got flight tickets for you and your wife. And um, yeah, that was that. I flew out to him. I was there with him for like three weeks, just hanging out. And his day he was like not having to play the Michael Jackson part. It was just him, him and me just chilling out in the hotel room. And we went to watch uh, Toy Story 2 together uh, with his kids and, and just hang out while he was recording and did a bit, bit of training and planned some ideas. Uh, I wanted to help him out of a charity he was doing. He wanted to try and get the world to spend time with their kids eating meals together, stuff like that. So he uh, launched a campaign called Heal the Kids, which I was behind hugely and worked with him on. And we launched that from Carnegie Hall in Manhattan in 2000. Um, yeah, and to me, he was just a friend, you know, and he'd come and visit me all the time. What I didn't understand at the time is how people would perceive that. And, and why is this 18-year-old guy... How the hell has he got all this success? And now he's hanging around with the most famous man on earth. And Joe Gordon, it didn't really hit to me until I was actually on the side of a stage with Michael. In 99, he did a show called Michael Jackson and Friends in Munich in Germany. And he wanted me to come out and hang out with him to keep him company. And I saw him rehearse. And the guy that rehearsed and the guy that I knew privately was two very different people. And, when, and then I watched him perform in the nighttime and, and he just... Literally, he's hanging out underneath the stage like this, you know, like 80,000 people screaming his name. Then they get inside this thing. Um, we call it a toaster, and he pops him out of the stage, and he lands He lands in this position, like a ready position, you know. And he stays, like, completely still. And I was still on the side of the curtains, and I never heard so much noise screaming. So my thoughts, one minute I was down on the ground with him underneath the stage, just talking about stuff. No nerves from the guy whatsoever. And then I go to the side of the stage, he flows out of the stage and stays still for like three minutes. And I'm supposed to be looking after him at this point as like a bodyguard stroke friend. And I think, and I didn't know, is this part of the deal or what? And actually Yuri's, this, one of Yuri Geller's assistants uh, said, oh, you, maybe you should go out and see him. And I'm so glad I did it because that was part of the act. He stays still. <laughs> and, and this TV show, this, this show, Michael Jackson and Friends, now some Mandela was in the crowd and stuff. It's been beamed all around the world, so I would have made a complete fool of myself. I would have walked up to the <laughs> one of his acts, and he just twitches his head, and the whole crowd goes mad. And he throws the jacket off, and then he went into uh, "Where You Make Me Feel" and Billy Jean and stuff. And the stage was rocking. And he come off stage, and we have to we have to run like hell. Like he like he's off stage. But the crowd don't realise, but we're in in the hotel room with him, and he's watching the end of the show before they're let out. They, they still think he's on stage. Do we, we have like a lookalike of body doubles and stuff and techniques to do that. So we run like out. And I get to the hotel room and he puts his pajamas on, sits down. And I'm like, Mike, uh, where the hell did that all come from? He goes, I got no clue. He said, I got no idea. It just comes from above. I just it's like a totally different guy to, uh, to the shy, soft spoken thing. But the bloke was just a genius in what we call personal branding this, these days with his image making and fall in the public. And um, he, he always used to say, oh, they fall into my trap. And I, if you look at the, my career, I've obviously learned a lot from that guy. I don't want to correct negative things. I don't want to talk out um, about things because that's the way you got to stay a mystery for people to be interested in you. Yeah. I created this image on the back of what he taught me. Negativity is fine. It's fine. It's good. it's good to be controversial. Yuri says to me all the time, I'm famous, Matt, for 50 years and still make it you know, one of the most famous guys in the world because I've been controversial my whole life. You look at the greats like Madonna, Usher, 
all these people, they all, they're all controversial in a way. You don't get to know, they're reinventing themselves the whole time. And Michael was a genius at that. And he used to read three or four nonfiction books a week. And he used to find who's good in their field. And he used to study them, like mod, what we call modeling, like Tony Robbins teaches. And that's why I wanted to meet Bruce Lee's uh, daughter and ex wife. So he wanted to find out what made Bruce Lee have that extra special tick so that he could take his career to the next level. And yeah, I'll, I'll cover the controversial stuff. He didn't want to know people to know if he's gay or straight, right? Because no, he was taught at five years old, don't tell uh, by Motown, don't tell uh, the public if you have a girlfriend because you'll lose half your fan base. That's the way he was conditioned. He was one of the old schoolers. So right to the very end, he was taught that. We nearly got him to uh, open up about it, but he had girlfriends. I, I mean, I know because I was with him all the time. He married Lisa Marie Presley, man. I mean, those two were jiggy out all the time. I know it was a few rooms down. He's had girlfriends. He's published books. Um, and he doesn't get a lawsuit from the Michael Jackson estate because it's the truth. Um, but unfortunately, the media know about this. And I've had the Daily Mail many times say to me, and I, I mentioned, why don't you interview her? She's I've just spoken to her. She was Michael's girlfriend for the last eight years of his life. Yeah, we know about her. But it goes against the narrative. So we can't we can't talk about her. And I'm like, well, that's not fair. You can't talk about my friend like that, you know? But he was a huge inspirational to to me, he wasn't into young boys and all that stuff. That's just absolutely ridiculous. But when you're the biggest star in the world, you're the biggest target. And he was very naive. He built Neverland to help charities. That was in his home, Gord. He didn't feel at home there at all. He liked being in the hotel suites and stuff where he had extra security. I mean, he had over 150 bodyguards at security at Neverland because people used to helicopter, used to uh, parachute in and I hope they could meet him. He couldn't walk around the grounds on his own. He had people following him, cameras everywhere. There was no privacy there. And the fairground and all that stuff, he used to limit the Georgian to like an hour or two hours a week on it. He was very clever. You don't get to be the most successful man in the, the world, most famous man in the world, with the biggest selling albums in the world, and franchised out all over his branding and stuff if you haven't got the intelligence about him. So, about him. so there's the qualities of his soft side, which comes from his mother, Catherine, and the ruthless businessman, which comes from his father, Joe Jackson. And Michael had two parts, but you'd only see the image that he wanted to create. Before we go to public, he'd always remind us, make sure you keep the mystery going. I want my life to be the biggest mystery on earth. And then what happens, unfortunately, is he's gone now. He's not here to speak for himself. His image he's created backfired on him. You know, that was there was no social media in 2009. We had like uh, MySpace and, yeah. and stuff like that. Email was just becoming the common thing. But had he been now, he'd be able to jump on Clubhouse or Facebook Live and clear things up. He, he was reliant on journalists to tell the truth. But they were only negative media will get you where you want to be. It's sex, drugs, rock and roll, baby. That's it. That's the only way you're going to get in a newspaper. Mm. Not for a positive story. So he, it's so true and 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 uh, amazing mate. And, and like you just you know just sharing the journey aren't you so with that then so all of that thing and, and i and i know you know like i know the the controversy around that in the martial arts world you didn't know michael jackson all that how does that make you feel when you hear that like when you heard that because that's got to hurt like it's got to like well if, you know he's your friend people say well you don't but you know yeah not the time he did he only had an umbrella for him and all of that kind of stuff and clearly man yeah how does that make you feel like as a, as a person when you've clearly had they gotta be, they gotta be idiots right i mean it's like go to youtube stick him out for there's michael jackson there's like flipping eight years worth of video content where we're out and about and uh the umbrella thing i get that i tell you why that picture is always used a picture of michael jackson especially in death is worth a lot of money and it's copyrighted now on that day that was when we brought him to yuri geller owned the football ground so we convinced him to come down and do this fundraiser for HIV and AIDS. We had like 8,000 people there. And he wanted me up on stage with him. It, it wasn't planned. It just happened. Actually, he just pointed to me and to said, I need you up here. Because uh, I was the one who didn't have a kid at the time. So I was quite happy to take the bullet, basically. And uh, we get used to get threats every day with him. Now, we let all the paparazzi in that day because we wanted maximum exposure for, for that event because it was a big charity event. So why that picture of the umbrellas used so much is because it's copyright free. No one can pinpoint who's took it. And that annoys me why they don't use other well, I've got stuff here. It's my child, my child's bedroom, right? And uh they so you got one here, like me and Mike. I don't know where the heck we are there. Cross, cross the other way, mate. That's me and Mike there. Yeah. The I got one here, me and him in uh in my house back then. I mean he's like a 
across the other way. That's it. That's in my living room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to be a freaking idiot. And the other thing, too, is you go on to, you know, onto these big documentaries, which I feature in a lot of them. They, they have researchers and stuff. They research you out. Actually, last night was quite interesting because uh, I had a text from a, from, um, a fan club and uh, there's none of my Jackson documentary come out. I'm all over it. And they've used interviews from me that I've given about him in the past and stuff. And uh, it's on Amazon Prime. I never even knew about it. There's one I one I did after the allegations were made against him a couple of years ago, that stupid documentary, um, with those two two guys, which I knew one of them very, very well, Wade and James. And and um, we did a combat one where the estate said, you know, get together, let's attack it. And we did one called Chase the Truth. And um, we went back and, and we attacked the allegation, proved that it's wrong. And actually, one of those guys lost their case. What they failed to mention in that documentary, which is the real narrative, is that the, both the boys were suing the Jack Michael Jackson estate for over for hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think it's unfair that wasn't included. So I think a lot of people would switch the channel for this is ridiculous. And those two lads, James, and well, not lads, they're one of them, they're both older than me. They were our star witnesses in 2005 when Michael Jackson was found not guilty in 14 charges. They were the guys who swore on oath that there were nothing happened to them and stuff, you know. And they talk about Mike's bedroom. Mike's bedroom is bigger than a mansion, man. It's on two floors, several bathrooms. It's not like that's that's his place where he can have some privacy. It's not like a bedroom, you know. He's got a fireplace in there. He's got his jacuzzi. It's, it's like a whole, it's like a whole mansion within his cell. Massive apartment, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not. But they just get the wrong thing. I think it's the trouble with Mike is that he um he was so conditioned to stick by the image and not care about what people would say, and and now it's backfired. It's taken people like me, like Mark Lester is uh is Mike, Michael's best friends. Oliver Twist. Mark is godfather to my daughter, and he's also godfather to all of Michael's children. So those idiots out there think I never knew him. Why would Mark have anything to do with me? Yeah. You know, where's all this footage? Who is this guy then? <laughs> he's getting screamed out wherever he go. Yeah. Do you know what it is, Gord? This is what I found with Michael. I don't get it with any of the other celebrities that I've worked with. Only him. We used to walk down hotel corridors and people used to check out of the room. And then he used to bump into us. And they're like, oh, it can't be you. It can't be. And Michael used to say, I have to be somewhere in the world at some time. But he mm. creates this like mystique about mm. him that people didn't think he's actually a real character. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. We left the hotel once and um, there was a lot of fans and paparazzi at the, at the foyer. So we took the back entrance from his hotel suite through the kitchen and we came out through the conference entrance to this hotel. And we bumped into this bride and groom that just got married. And he didn't think about it. And he uh, he went up and he um, shook the guy's hands. Congratulations, getting married. And then the bride wanted, wanted to have a picture with him. And he took a picture with the bride. And then we got in the lift. And he looks at me, he said, Matt, I've just done something stupid, haven't I? I said, yeah, man. He looks like you just got married, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so please go back and go tell them not to give that, pre that picture to the media. And he started to cry about it. You know, I just had to go back and find him and say, listen, please, permission to take, don't release that picture to the media. They're going to say he's got married. This is why you had to go through. It was just how. It was like, there was no glamour there. You couldn't do nothing. Nothing at all. But I'll tell you some funny story. Bob Sykes, is this is hilarious, right? So um, they put me, Yuri, me and Yuri Geller on the front cover of Martial Arts Illustrated and did a story about uh, what we were doing together and mind power, martial arts, mindset, and so on. You, Michael saw that. Michael saw it at my house. He wanted to be on the front cover of Martial Arts Illustrated. I didn't think that would be an issue. I thought Bob Sykes would be cool with that. This was back in, like, early 2000s. So I called Bob up. And I was trying to, trying to show off to Michael a little bit. Michael sat next to me. I put, I put Bob on like loudspeaker. He said, hey, Bob. I'm here. I'm next to Michael Jackson. Um, and he, I think he said a quick hi to Bob. And uh, uh, Bob didn't realize I was on loudspeaker. And he said, uh, um, Michael's, you know, he's a martial artist and stuff. And me and Bob were close friends by this time. He knew I was good friends with Michael. He said, um, uh, Mike, Michael would like to be on front cover. He doesn't want any money for it. He just wants to promote the values of martial arts and what it can do to empower people and stuff. And he's like, ah, oh, Matt, I, I, to be honest, Michael Jackson, not my cup of tea. I just like to walk the hills around Huddersfield and stuff and things. Uh, it's not the right time right now and stuff. And then he laughs about it now because when Michael died, it was, ah, he put Michael on the front cover of me. Everyone was out for him, you know, and it's like, and also like Kim Stones too. Kim will openly tell you 
is that I called Kim up and David Lowe, another guy, I think you know David. Yeah. David's got an amazing story. I, got, I called Dave, one of my assistants called David up. He's on my guest list to come to an event to meet Michael and uh, have a private function that we have. And he, he was a sun, on a Sunday or Saturday night. It's a Saturday night. And he said to his wife, he, was, he had Bitomic at that time. He said to his wife, uh, Matt has invited us down tomorrow night. There apparently there's some celebrity there who I want to meet. Um, and, the, and in the end, they decided to turn up. At the last minute, they decided not to go. They were tired. And then the next morning, he said he was what he turned the news on and he was choking on his cornflakes because it's all over the press. Uh, on I on on, on uh, what was it, Big Breakfast back then? Michael Jackson is here at this event. And he's like, you, and he called his wife and said, You know what? Last night, you've made me miss the biggest opportunity of my life because you said you were too tired. And <laughs> Keith Stone says it all the time to me. He's like, That opportunity, I had missed it. We just thought it was a prank, Matt. How the hell could you be hanging around with him at 18 years old? Well, that's that's the, think, that was the thing. I think that's the thing, isn't it? And I think that people, I mean, clearly, you, 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 you know, you were friends with him. Like, you can tell, you know a lot about him, you know. And I think that's important. And I think you had this image then, haven't you, through the martial arts industry around the Michael Jackson thing. That really is the thing. That, the money, the fame, and all of that kind of stuff that came with it. And you completely disrupt the industry. But um, I want to say thanks for doing the interview today, Matt, because we could go on for hours and hours with this. And I know we've got some really good comments here as well as we're, as we're listening in. And what, what strikes me is that you've been on a huge journey in your life and you've come through from where you were, which is, you know, highly successful at 17, 18, 19, 20 years, all the way through, disrupted an industry, you know, learned, you've, you've shared some amazing things that martial arts school owners need to know. Like they need to understand the importance of customer service. It's, it's not about, it's all about the other person. You know, that's what your brand, um, you know, personifies in many ways. And what's been great along this as well is learning about you as a person, about who you are, about the, you know, really the, you know, the hard times that you've had, the lessons that you've learned, which you shared eloquent, so eloquently through this. Um, and, and, and I want to say a big respect to you um, for what you've done and what you continue to do and what you're, you know, where you're moving into. And what really struck me is, and I think this is perfect, where you realise that it doesn't really matter about all them things. What matters is family. What matters is, you know, uh, love. And I think that is so beautiful, Matt. And, and you know, it couldn't, you know, it, you, you know, it really resonates with me. And, you know, we're all striving for greatness in our own ways and things that we want to achieve and you know what you've done won't be for everybody for sure you know like you said you wouldn't fain wouldn't be but what success in any way and i think what's really important for everyone here success in any form don't sacrifice what's really really important and i think yeah. that's a great message matt a great great message so is there anything else you would like to to share and um, before we finish i, I just like to send some real love to my haters for getting me to where i am thank you so much <laughs> I can assure you, I ain't going anywhere, and the best is yet to come. And uh, it's all about changing lives, Gordon. That's all my career has been about, changing someone's life. You're going to get a reward for doing that. That's all it's about. Whether it's in martial arts or any other subjects I'm doing, but, you know, it's all about changing their lives. And uh, if you make a difference to someone else, you'll get paid back over and over and over again. But, yeah, my life has been weird. I, I've learned to accept that now and, uh, and stuff. But maybe he's been privileged. I don't know. It depends how you want to describe it. But um, yeah, I just want everyone to learn from what I've been through. And you only need so much money. Money doesn't change things. You can arrive at your problems of style. You can help other people. I mean, I pay for operations and stuff for for, for uh, people who can't afford it to, to help, like breast cancer. I'm very passionate about that. So I lost my mum to that. I funded my uh, Monique's auntie. She she's South Africa. She got diagnosed with breast cancer. They don't have NHS out there. You die. Simple as that. I had her in. I had her in. A, I paid for the whole thing. All done. She's still alive now. So like seven, eight years later, she's in the surgery. With surgeons within forty-eight hours. That's what it's about. It's not about the cars. We we can all get out there and afford enough food to eat and have a roof over our head. Or the government will help you with that. There's only so many cars you can get. So many holidays you can take. And I think what's happened with the the COVID thing is that. You know, I shared with you before COVID, I was looking at probably calming things down a bit, but it's made me realize now we're all very vulnerable creatures and I've got great contacts and a great inner circle still, even, even though Mike's gone, it allowed me access to a lot of his powerful 
friends who have still stayed in contact with me. And the lessons I've learned that I didn't really learn, knew that I learned, I came into my mind naturally that I just want to help other people now who've been hit with COVID hard to go out there to make sure that with coronavirus, or, you know, we know the media likes this type of stuff pandemics, world crises, that's going to stick around, I'm afraid to say. I, I saw on a news report a couple of weeks ago, and no disrespect to bird lovers, but they had a news feature, headline news on a pandemic that was killing swans, as in the bird. Unbelievable. It was mainline news. And I think you've got to protect, you've got to get yourself now, not just business owners, but the public. I've got to call, well, I call it bulletproof your finances. So if a world crisis did come around again, that you've got yourself in a position where you don't have to worry about money mm-hmm. at all, that you can feed your kids, you can leave a legacy, you've got the things in place. And the sad thing, Gordon, they don't teach you this at school, you know, they don't teach you. And I don't understand why. I don't get that. Um, but you've got, you've got to now actually get yourself ready because I don't – I think coronavirus will come to an end. Then we'll have the boom. But there's going to be some other stuff come out in the future. And if you've got your eggs in place that, that I'm trying to now – I decided just to open the doors, you know. I, I got no ego, I, whatever. I don't care if I see someone struggling. I'll jump on a Zoom for fifteen minutes, and I know you do the same thing too, and and try and pull them through. And uh, you got to get everything in place now to, to bulletproof yourself in case it's coming around again. Because we didn't know this. This hit like a like an animal. And sadly, got not many of the martial arts schools, you know, who are out there. A lot of them didn't make it or just give up. They just couldn't handle it. But the ones that do push forward now, you'll come through this and you'll have the biggest growth ever. But you've got to get yourself to six figures first and then you need to invest so that you're earning money while you sleep in passive income. And I, I know that's something that you're passionate about too, motivating and changing lives. And, uh, so, yeah, for now, you know, for me, it's not about the money. I want my franchises to be set up forever for life so they don't have to worry about things. They, they get the real life lessons about what I'm about, what I do. And I, guys, you know, I know people have hated me before, but if they ever want any advice, they can contact me for you, Gord, or shoot me an email. Not an issue, you know. I'm a, I'll help out if you're struggling out there right now, if your mindset or whatever. Then, uh, you know, any, anything. If you watch this video back and you got a question, then just message Gord and they'll get it to me. We'll get we'll get it back to you. We, we're just here to try and help you all, really. And uh, yeah, COVID. I said to my wife, I'm 40 years old. I'm going to calm it down a bit. But I realized, actually, I can't calm it down. I've been too privileged with my inner circle, and I should be going out there and helping not just martial artists, but in my organization, but outside that, all business owners, teaching the stuff that I've been taught to me at a young age that they don't teach you at school. It's not available out there for my real-world hard school of Knox life, you know, and not just the glamour side, and maybe talk about my failures a bit more too. And I've, you know, Gordon, I've worked out – I've set up about 16 businesses that have failed. Of course you have. You don't hear about them. It doesn't yeah. surprise me. I, and, 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 and I know that would be the case. And um, you've been totally humble through this whole interview, great mate. And it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you on here. I knew you'd have a load of wisdom. And it's great to hear your story. And a great for martial arts schools to hear your story and to really unravel Matt Fidesz. Uh, the person behind it, who I know has got a big heart. So uh, thanks for joining us, mate, on this interview. It's been great to have you on, mate. You're welcome, sir. Um, reach out um, to Matt and, you know, I know he's got a, a, a mission in his life going forward. So thank you very much, my friend. Thank you for listening, guys. That was Matt Fidesz and we will speak to you again soon. Take care, mate, and uh, thanks for listening.